Thank you for showing up here. Uh, what an exciting day for physics, right? So uh, I was watching the uh, press conference of the LIGO team uh, this morning, and probably most of you did. Uh, and that's uh, truly a remarkable achievement. A remarkable achievement because uh, they actually uh, ventured towards uh, gearing their experiments uh, to measurement precision, which is quantum limited. I mean, most of you uh, probably are experimental physicists, and, and most of us do experiments. However, in hardly any of the experiments we are doing, we actually really reach the quantum limits or the limits being set by quantum mechanics to precision. And in particular, not for, say, sensors, uh, which one even could uh, use for uh, looking into uh, uh, living cells or which might have medical use. And actually, it's, it's this, this attempt uh, or our attempt to reach quantum limited measurements for those sensors this talk is going to be about. Uh, actually, the physics uh, we're uh, doing is, is very much related to uh, uh, what people uh, do at LIGO, right? LIGO is nothing but an interferometer, as you see it here, where you uh, measure uh, distance differences of these two test masses here with respect to that beam splitter. And there, there's lots of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering going into this, but there's also quantum mechanics going into this, because the distances you measure by uh, measuring interference of light beams. And these light beams, they come with noise, right? Of course, they are, this is a laser uh, light, but it comes with noise. And uh, the, the LIGO team and other teams, uh, also in, in GEO and in other interferometers, uh, they actually um, took quite some effort to put the noise in, in the corner of, of the Hilbert space where it doesn't disturb them, right? Uh, so what they were doing, instead of you know, uh, working with a, a conventional ground state of the light they use here, the laser is emitting, which probably would be, if you uh, uh, think of it, uh, it's equivalent in terms of an harmonic oscillator, which would be a, a light state where the uncertainty in, in space and in momentum is exactly h bar over 2, what they did is they were squeezing the light. That is, they were trading uncertainty uh, in, in terms of the uh, momentum for uh, getting more certainty in terms of uh, position. And this is how they were able, actually, to measure these 10 to the minus 22 or 23 or so of squeezing, that is, of distance differences here between these two test masses out of the fluctuation of the laser beam. And we are doing something similar, right? We don't work with uh, lasers. Well, we work with lasers to begin with, but the, the, the Hilbert space or the, the quantum mechanical degree of freedom we are playing around with is not actually looking at interference of light, right? The quantum mechanical entity uh, we are interested in actually are spins, and we treat them, those spins in such a way that they deliver minimum uncertainty in the quantity we want to measure. And how we do that, that's actually what I'm going to explain to you. Well, there is one, uh, there, there is a whole set of, uh, say, uh, spin systems we use for sensing, and why we use them will become uh, apparent to you uh, in a second. But let me just introduce you uh, to you the key players. Uh, so uh, uh, typically, as sensor materials, we use these, what we call impurity-based spin quantum systems. And those would be uh, defects in diamond, for example, uh, rare earth dopants in, in, in these kind of materials here, which is actually uh, the material lasers, or part of the lasers we use are made of. And we also use uh, defects in silicon carbide, um, a field which has been pioneered by uh, David Upshalom. So actually, what's, what's so special about uh, these systems? Now, they combine actually two um, key ingredients to our sensor materials. Uh, one is, on the, un on the one hand, uh, we can read out, that is, we can measure, we can detect uh, these quantum systems by optical means. So that's exactly equivalent uh, to LIGO. So all of these systems you have seen, these defects in diamond, silicon carbide, or rare earth atoms, they do have a strongly allowed, uh, electrically allowed uh, dipole transition uh, with transition energies on the order of electron volts. Uh, and the reason is that, that we have good detectors at, at these energies, which actually can measure single photons with pretty high uh, 
fidelity, detection probability over 80%. In addition, these sensor materials, these defects, also do have spin ground states, right? Uh, and it is these spin ground states actually we use for sensing. And, and typically what we do is we measure spin splittings, energy splitting in these ground states, and this is actually the way we do our sensing. And we can do this with a precision down to femtoelectron volts, right? And we do this, uh, we, we measure these transitions here with this precision on top, you know, uh, of these electron volt transitions. So we have a, a kind of an energy resolution uh, better or on the order of 10 to the minus 15, right, at room temperature. And that's basically the basis for our sensitivity. All right, um, so these are the sensor levels and that's the sensor readout. And we do it optically because if you, we could put leads to these defects, right, and have an electrical readout, that's, some, that's what people sometimes do. But if you do an elect electrical readout, you hardly ever approach the shot noise limit, right, the Johnson noise limit of your detector. Typically you have some kind of electronic uh, noise, excess noise in your system and that's not what you want to have. This is why we do it optically. All right, so uh, actually how does this, this, this kind of entry level schemes uh, come along in, in the systems uh, we are working with? And uh, for us, uh, these, these defects in diamond are, uh, you know, the kind of guinea pig system uh, we use. Uh, now, most of you do know diamond. Diamond is made up out of carbon, right? Each carbon atom has uh, uh, four nearest neighbors. And that actually makes its material properties. It's a very hard material. Uh, it, uh, it has a band gap of around five electron volts or so. So it's a decent insulator. Uh, and if you dope it, so if you put a nitrogen atom here instead of a carbon atom and a vacancy, and we know how to do this uh, with great precision, uh, then uh, we call this an NV center. And what that changes is that you get these two isolated states in the band gap of the material uh, with an energy splitting of around two electron volts, right? So that's what we want to have for, uh, for our uh, sensor. Uh, we get strong fluorescence, or most people call it photoluminescence, um, so strong that, that you see actually an individual of, of, you see a single of such an impurity inside diamond, right? Uh, no difficulty, that's actually a kitchen table uh, experiment and that's done at, at room temperature. Uh, and now comes the spin, right? Uh, for this particular system, uh, you have a spin one ground state, so you have not two spin sublevels, spin up and spin down, but you have both, spin up, both spins up, both spins down, and then you have this, you know, these kind of uh, combinations, and that's why you have three spin sublevels here. Um, the, uh, what we can do is uh, we can now uh, induce magnetic dipole transitions down here, right? That's just a spin flip transition. Then we look at the fluorescence uh, of the system uh, as a function of microwave frequency and we see these kind of dips. And the dips comes about because only this spin sublevel here takes part in optical excitation and emission. That's just, you know, uh, a classical um, selection rule. This is an allowed optical dip dipole transition here, whereas the other ones would constitute a spin flip transition. So it's exactly uh, if you shine uh, laser light on the system, you uh, 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 apply these microwaves here, you look at the frequency, uh, the fluorescence as a function of microwave frequency, you see this dip. Okay, so that's basically the sensor signal, right? Uh, now, uh, you not only can measure now the, the frequency of that precision uh, um, uh, line here pretty precisely, right? Uh, you can also, for example, coherently drive the spin. That is, you can look at the fluorescence intensity and then apply a microwave pulse here. And you increase the microwave pulse length and then you see these oscillations. And these oscillations basically is just nothing but Rabi oscillation. That's a, that's a standard thing you, you use in coherent optics but also in coherent uh, spin, EPR or NMR spectroscopy. Now, and these oscillations are important because they constitute a fundamental limit in the sense of precision, and I'm coming to that in a second. And that fundamental limit actually is the spin relaxation time. Because you can only measure the position of that line with an accuracy which is limited by the spin relaxation time uh, of the system, right? That's energy uncertainty, delta E 
times delta t is something like h bar. And because spin relaxation time in diamond is very long, it's on the order of 10 milliseconds at room temperature, right? Compare that, for example, to gallium arsenide, where the spin relaxation time would be on the order of microseconds at 2 Kelvin. You can measure that line position so precisely. And that makes this, these systems, also silicon carbide, for example, distinct, distinct from other materials. Right, another material you could use, for example, would be phosphorus and silicon. If you do that, then this relaxation time would also be on the order of nano, even sub-nanosecond at room temperature. And this is why we use this system. All right, um, so uh, what are the quantities actually we can measure uh, with these kind of systems? Well, on the one hand, we for sure can measure magnetic fields, right? If you go back here, uh, right, uh, these are spin levels, and if you apply a magnetic field, then the splitting here would change just by the Zeeman effect. So we can use spins to measure magnetic fields. And actually, uh, uh, if you buy, say, uh, a magnetic field measurement device, then with, with some probability it is based on a spin measurement, mostly an NMR measurement. So that's what we can do. Actually, our sensors, and I'm giving you here some kind of ballpark figures, uh, our sensor uh, is able to measure, for example, the magnetic moment of one nuclear spin at, at a few, say, three nanometer distance, right, within an averaging time of one second. This is why I'm giving you the square root of Hertz um, uh, unit. Um, it's not only measuring magnetic fields, it's also measuring electric fields, and that comes about by spin orbit coupling, uh, a tiny spin orbit coupling, though, but it's good enough, actually, for example, to measure a single electron, electron charge uh, at around 0.2 micron distance, right? Uh, the electric field of a point charge goes as 1 over r cubed, and this is uh, 1 over r square, and this is why you can measure it further out than, for example, the magnetic field uh, of the electron on nuclear spin. Our uh, sensor is also good for uh, measuring temperature of forces, and I'm going to explain to you how this actually goes. Uh, so temperature accuracy is millikelvin. That's not great, right? Every thermometer or so easily, you know, makes a couple of microkelvins or so per square root of hertz uh, sensitivity. Uh, and, and it also measures force. Uh, so it has a force sensitivity of Otto Newton. And once again, how this comes about, I'll, I'll explain later on. So I don't know if, how familiar you are uh, with, with these numbers here or how familiar you are with, you know, competing electric field measurement devices or magnetic field measurement devices. But, but in a nutshell, all these numbers are not very amazing, right? They are not record numbers. What makes them good is that on the one hand, uh, you, these values you achieve at room temperature, and you have very good spatial resolution. Your sensor basically is only one atom in size. And if you combine that with these kind of sensitivities, right, that makes a really outstanding system. Okay, so let's go through some application, and that's actually uh, uh, the menu uh, for the rest, uh, say, 30, 35 minutes or so uh, for my talk. I'd like to show you how we measure, actually, an image magnetic fields, uh, and I'll show you a bit about our precision nanoscale temperature measurements, and then I'm going to give you an out where we want to go. All right, so, so let's start with this one here. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing so by reconsidering, uh, you know, sensitivity. So, so what actually, what is it when I'm talking about sensitivity? Uh, where does these limitations come from? Now let's look at, at, at the case when we actually measure a magnetic field. And now what I'm showing you here are once again these spin sublevels, right? We are now in the ground state of the defect. Forget about the optics, that's just good for readout. Uh, we have these three spin sublevels. This is the one where we get light from when we excite, and these are the dark ones. Now you uh, apply a uh, magnetic field. Okay, so now there we are. Uh, so we apply a magnetic field, all right? And uh, because the magnetic moment of the electron spin is interacting with that magnetic field, this splitting here changes. That's nothing but the Zeeman. Uh, shift, okay? And then we measure this splitting instead of that one, and we can conclude on the magnetic field. Now, uh, we have a tiny sensor, so if we have an inhomogeneous magnetic field like this horseshoe here, 
and we put our uh, you know, diamond with a defect here at this position or at this position, we measure different magnetic fields or we measure different frequencies here, right? Different delta E's. And now the precision of our field measurement is limited actually by the precision with which we can measure actually that specific frequency, all right? New one or uh, new two. Um, well, so actually what limits that precision? Let's look at that experiment in a different way and that's exactly basically how, how the LIGO people were measuring it, right? Uh, if you uh, watch the press conference, then they were talking about fringes and, and interferences. And that's exactly what we do here. We don't use an interferometer and we don't use uh, light beams to interfere. But what we use is actually the, pre the evolution of a quantum state over time. That's, and that's actually the analogy. So what we do is um, actually we watch our spin to process in the field we want to measure, okay? So we start with some state, for example, with the spin being here, then we let it coherently evolve in the magnetic field, and after some time, we measure this phase phi, okay? And that phase phi here uh, is directly related to the magnetic field. So if you multiply H over here, then this becomes a frequency unit, and then you are back at your uh, uh, frequency measurement, all right? So this phase phi you can measure uh, uh, um, uh, with a precision which is only limited by t, right? These are all constants, and that's the quantity you want to measure. So the longer you can measure, the more fringes, the more rotations you can accumulate, the more or the better you can measure phi. Now what limits t? t is limited actually by the decoherence time. So when you, uh, when this, when you spin here, after, uh, you know, after you concluded your measurement, doesn't have a definite f value of phi uh, because, for example, it was scattered by phonons, uh, because uh, you, you have some, some noise magnetic field in the background, right? Then you cannot measure phi anymore uh, very precisely. And the characteristic time here is T2, right? That's called dephasing time. That's millisecond for, for these defect centers, and that's a record value at least at room temperature, right? There is no other spin system which would allow you to measure for longer. And now if you calculate sensitivity, uh, and once again, that's exactly what the LIGO people do when they, did, uh, when they give a number for the strain they measure. So here I give a number for the magnetic field I can measure. Then you see these are all, you know, G factor is a fundamental constant of the electron spin, mu b, uh, here you, we have h bar. It's only limited by the square root of that time plus a constant C here, and I'm, I'm coming to. Now, the magnetic field, if you, if you uh, put in all these numbers and a reasonable value for C here, then you come up with a magnetic field of 10 nanotesla, and there is something missing here, it should say 10 nanotesla square root of hertz. Okay, so that's the magnetic field of a single nuclear spin at 10 nanometer distance. I, I don't know if you do magnetic field measurements. Well, you, you operate magnetic fields, right? Uh, certainly much larger than these ones here, but if you would do magnetic field measurements, then most likely you would use uh, squids or so, right? Superconducting quantum interference devices. There, this number is more on the order of femtotesla per square root of hertz. Way more uh, sensitive, but it's also way more bigger, right? So a, a good squid or so has a size of a micron, at least most likely 10 microns in diameter. Here, our sensor, has a size of a few angstrom, right? That makes a difference. And it doesn't need helium. Okay, so, so what can we do to make it uh, more sensitive? We could increase T2, but that's somehow a fundamental limit uh, of the solid we are working with. Uh, one thing we could use is we could play around with this C. And one way to play around with this C here, that's actually the signal to noise of the readout, so that's actually the, 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 the signal to noise of your detector, if you like, right, your detector uh, everything else uh, besides the spin itself. Well, the signal to noise, uh, C, I was putting in this uh, first equation was the one for a single defect. Now, actually, you can, in, instead of using a single defect, you can put in d n defects, and then the signal to noise goes as square root of n, right? That's the standard quantum limit. Uh, if you do that, so if you go from a single defect to a small diamond, say five microns, and you look at the magnetic sensitivity 
uh, over you know, the time it takes to measure, so this would be then one hertz, uh, one hertz or one second of measurement time, then this is on the order of picotesla per square root of hertz. And if you measure longer, then you come to the femtotesla square root of hertz uh, limit. So that's one way. Making your sensor a bit bigger right, is one way to make it more sensitive. And if you look at this, at it this way, then it's absolutely compatible with the most sensitive uh, detectors you can get, for example, with the squid, right? Which typically has this size and this sensitivity. So where do we want to apply it? Um, actually, uh, we do something which uh, sounds a bit weird uh, in the first, uh, on first sight. So, so we construct diamond helmets. Uh, and we construct these diamond helmets because we want to measure neural magnetic fields, right? If you do that nowadays, uh, then, then typically what people do is they, they sit in, in, in these installations here. That's, uh, that's a squid magnetometer. Squids need uh, low temperatures. Uh, so for this device, this is a helium tank here. Uh, and then there is a, a, you know, a whole area of squids around the brain of this guy. And this is actually how people nowadays measure magnetic field activities of your brain. And, <sighs> And what we try to do is make that radically more uh, um, simple by having a room temperature, you know, kind of you, these kind of uh, structures here uh, with also much better spatial resolution. There is one competing technology, uh, Svenja Knappe from, from NIST. Uh, some of you might know her, at least if you're interested in measuring or doing brain imaging, for example. Uh, she's developing uh, atom vapor magnetometers uh, and, and this would be, this is one of her prototype devices. Um, so these are five millimeters, and what we want to do is do the same thing basically with five micron, micrometer size detectors. The target sensitivity we need to have is something like 30 femtotesla square root of hertz, and we are almost there, right? And that would really radically simplify these kind of measurements. So this would be kind of macroscopic, measuring macroscopic biomagnetic fields. Uh, we also want to go microscopic. Uh, and the way uh, we do this uh, is uh, combining our sensor with optical microscopy, right? So for now, I was just saying you, we, we read out the light which is emitted by, by the defects. We just measure all of the light we get. But what you could also do is uh, uh, you could have uh, uh, a diamond ship, right? So that would be a diamond. Then you put a layer of defects close to the surface and your specimen on top. And rather than reading out all of the fluorescence of that layer here, you read it out point by point in a microscope. Okay? And by this, you get spatial information on the magnetic field on top. Um, so, so one experiment we were doing is uh, um, uh, taking a cell. So uh, this is a through cut here uh, uh, through a, a cell. And we were labeling the cell membrane uh, with a fluorescent dye and with an electron spin. And that electron spin is a magnetic moment we want to measure. And we did it this way to actually specifically label the membrane, make it visible. So here, uh, that's a bright field image of the cell on, on top of a normal optical microscope. And then that's a fluorescence image where you know, we were just measuring the fluorescence from this dye here. And that's the corresponding magnetic field map from actually that spin at the cell membrane and that almost falls on top of each other, uh, as you can see. And that's, as far as I know, the first MRI image, magnetic resonance image, with subcellular resolution. It doesn't look great, but, but for comparison, this is the first uh, you know, whole body MRI taken by Mansfield in, in, in 78, and you see that almost looks identical, except uh, that you know, this is here an abdominal cut through the body, and, and this would be here like half a meter or so, rather than five microns here. All right, so what are we going to do with this? Well, of course, now you can, you know, you can measure details of actually ions flowing across the membrane. That's what we want to do. Uh, but, but one thing uh, we are up to is uh, actually measuring, once again, neural uh, activity. Uh, neurons, as you probably know, they, they generate uh, action potentials. That is, they pump ions, or, or they, they, there is an ion flow through the neural cell membrane, right? And when the ion flows, of course, uh, then, then they generate a magnetic field. 
and you can measure that magnetic field, and by that you can measure how action potentials you know, spread across neural cell cultures. So that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a kind of an idea, a proposal paper we wrote a couple of years ago. This would be a neuron with a dendrite. You put it on the diamond substrate, uh, and by this you measure the local magnetic field, right? And this is a simulation of how actually this local magnetic field spreads across the cell membrane. And nobody has ever done this before, right? There are no really good measurements of no local neural activity uh, out there, except for with fluorescence microscopy, which is indirect. And this is our first uh, uh, attempt. So, so I'm a quantum physicist by heart, and I have, uh, well, uh, uh, and what we did is, uh, you know, we, we went to actually Australia far enough to do the first experiment. So we were taking actually um, axons, uh, nerves from, from these kind of frogs, which are used because they are particularly big, right? And here you see one of those uh, neural cells. Uh, and you you um, actually activate them, that is you make them working by applying a voltage, and this is why you see these clamps here. And then there is an actual potential running across uh, the, uh, uh, this cell here, and, and this is what you see, right? So this is a magnetic field signature. It looks like the signal from LIGO somehow, uh, right? Uh, with respect to signal to noise, I, I say. Um, but uh, that's good enough because that's exactly what we expect, right? So you expect a field of a few tens of nanotesla. Uh, and, and this is the first, uh, you know, first attempts along those lines. There's, by the way, also a very nice paper from, from the Wordsworth group from Harvard uh, showing very similar results uh, out on the archive, right? And that's the beginning. So, so what we now do is we look at more complex cell structures and follow that in doing, uh, doing images. Okay. Um, so uh, let's switch gears uh, and, and look at another application. And actually there is an application out there uh, where people measure magnetic fields and try to conclude you know, on your well-being from those magnetic fields, and that is uh, uh, in these MRI scanners. Right? So magnetic resonance imaging is basically nothing but measuring local nuclear magnetic moments in your body. Right, that's it. Uh, and the question is, can we do something similar? Uh, we are not uh, targeting these kind of length scales here, but, but we are more targeting much smaller length scales, but with much better sensitivity and much higher resolution than you get, get in these machines. All right, so, uh, so now actually what we need to do is, first of all, we need to tweak our magnetometer in such a way that we can measure uh, nuclear magnetic moments. Uh, the quest is that the nuclear magnetic moments are a factor of thousands smaller than that of electrons, right? Which we were measuring in all the other applications uh, so far. So you need somehow a clever measurement protocol to be able to do that with our sensor. And the way we do it is actually pretty similar, and also that somehow resembles LIGO. Uh, we uh, actually demodulate uh, the signal we get. So we get a signal with lots of noise on it, right? And we just look at a specific frequency component of that signal, okay? So, uh, it, and the thing, and the, the way it goes is pretty trivial, actually. So you put your specimen, say this set of nuclear spins into a magnetic field, and what they do is they do a Lama precession, right? They all process with the same frequency. And you demodulate the signal you get at exactly that frequency, which you know because it's proportional to the magnetic field and, and it just, the, the Consensus going in is our fundamental consensus, uh, G and, and the gyromagnetic ratio, basically. So the demodulation actually uh, we do, so this would be the precessing nuclear magnetic, uh, uh, magnetic field of these nuclei here, and the demodulation we do uh, is once again similar to a trick in, in electronics, right? Uh, those of you uh, who are well, somehow my remote once in a while doesn't work. Um, so and actually what we do is, is pretty similar to uh, uh, what uh, we were doing, I should say, uh, in the days when we were operating these old analog radios, right? It's exactly the same situation. You have a transmitter station, and of course you have lots of magnetic noise around, elevators, uh, ventilators, and these kind of things. And, and what you do is, and uh, actually you have a local oscillator in this radio which you exactly tune in resonance with the frequency of the transmitter station you want to listen to. 
and then you do a phase sensitive demodulation. Right? And by this, you reject all noise outside the band actually you are, looking to, you are listening to. And that's what we do. And, and the, the way we, we, you know, we mimic this kind of uh, local oscillator here is by applying a, a train of pulses to the electron spin, which is exactly commensurate with, with the oscillation of this nuclear spin magnetic moments. All right? Uh, OK, so these are uh, the results. So here, basically, that signal strength of a frequency, and this is, so to say, uh, if you like, the, the signal strength of these, uh, you know, uh, of our nuclear spins uh, emitting these electromagnetic waves at exactly a few kilohertz frequency. So uh, what we do is we, we put, say, a bunch of protons, for example, water, on top of our diamond. Then we take an, uh, one of these defects. This is a single defect, just a few nanometers below, so that we can, you know, that the magnetic field still is large enough to be detected. Well, remember, these are all tiny dipoles, and the magnetic field decays as one over r cubed. And by doing this phase sensitive detection, we measure on the order of 100 proton spins in a detection volume which is on the order of 5 cubic nanometer uh, or so. Uh, OK. Uh, so right now, this is uh, 2013. Right now, people are down to a few nuclear spins, even single nuclear spins. Right, that's, and that all works under ambient conditions, room temperature, no big uh, instrumentation or so necessary. Uh, is that good? Well, potentially it is. Um, I, I don't know at, about you, you know, all the instrumentation in Argon, and I'm not sure if you have one of these machines here. That, that's a state-of-the-art nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer. That's a kind of, you know, this is a hallmark of a chemical and biochemical analysis, 50%, more than 50% of all protein structures we know come from these machines. They don't come from X-ray. They don't come from electron microscopy. They come from these machines, right? All chemical analysis, almost all simple chemical compounds or so have been analyzed, and the structures we, we know come actually through these machines. Uh, this is why they are abundant in, in basically in every chemistry, biochemistry, or biophysicist lab. Their sensitivity actually scales with the magnetic field, or omega, uh, omega to the power of two. This is why they get ever bigger, right? This here fills actually a room, well, it, it goes up to the ceiling of this room here. And I've been in, in, uh, uh, at, in Harvard uh, two weeks ago. They, they built a new building for the next generation, right, which, is, has a, which has an ever larger magnetic field. Sensitivity is 10 to the 15 nuclei, right? So and one of the motivations to get larger is getting more sensitive. And they also get more expensive, right? That's a $10 million machine or so. Now, our sensitivity is way better, right? It's 100 nuclei, and this is 100 thousand dollar or so uh, installation. So in that sense, we are absolutely, we are outperforming these uh, systems. Uh, is this something which is entirely changing the field? Probably it is, uh, yet there is one thing one actually needs to prove. Uh, the beauty of these systems here does not come from the sensitivity, but it comes from spectral resolution, right? A typical NMR spectrum, you probably have never seen it, but, but that's, that's one here of a small molecular weight compound looks like this. And this axis here, uh, actually you should read it as being, as covering roughly, say, 10 hertz or so. On the background of almost a gigahertz frequency, right? And this is what you need in order to actually analyze those structures here in detail. Okay, so uh, what about the spectral resolution we have? Um, Let's look at that once again, and uh, let's have a look here at this frequency axis. That's kilohertz, okay? Uh, and actually, this is oil here, which is a low-weight hydrocarbon kind of molecule, and it should have a width which is on the order of a hertz or so, but rather it has a kilohertz. How comes? Well, that's uh, pretty easy uh, to see. Actually, it comes from the limited frequency width of our local oscillator, right? Remember that example with the radio, if you have two transmitter stations which, are, which have just a few kilohertz of frequency difference, and you have a local oscillator in your radio which has, say, 10 kilohertz, 
then you will not be able to separate these two transmitter stations. Okay? So the local oscillator needs to have a frequency width which is smaller than the kind of difference in the frequencies of your transmitter stations. And what is the width of our local oscillator, the frequency width? That's given by this relaxation time, this T1. 1 over T1 is the frequency width of our local oscillator. Now this T1 here is on the order of a millisecond, so our local oscillator has a frequency width of 1 kilohertz. That's bad news to begin with, because it would tell you that you can't use it for high-resolution NMR uh, at all, our technique. Well, there would be one way. You could go to low temperature because this T1 is limited by spin phonon interaction. So if you reduce the number of phonons by cooling down the device, then T1 goes up. And indeed, it goes up to a second or even beyond seconds. So that would be a solution. But that's not what you want to have, right? If you, well, if you want to look, say, at biomolecules or complex, even, say, cells, you don't want to freeze them to death. Um, so uh, one way to work, to work around here actually is uh, to remind yourself that we are looking here at, we are using a single electron spin to measure tiny magnetic fields, but uh, there are other spins in that system which could help you. And I'm cutting that short uh, because I don't want to overpull too much. Well, um, so from now we just have used that electron spin here to measure that magnetic field. And now what we introduce are some helper spins. And these helper spins are carbon-13 nuclear spins in the diamond. Okay? Uh, and we use those carbon-13 spins, actually, which are coupled to the electron spin, to do precision measurements of outside magnetic fields. Now, how is this going? Uh, let me explain to you that, that in a second. First of all, these, these, these nuclear spins, actually, which we use as a quantum memory, they have fantastic properties. Their T1, for example, at room temperature is like four minutes, okay? We don't talk, no. electron spin was milliseconds. This is four minutes. And the T2, the dephasing time is on the order of seconds. So they are good enough, actually, to achieve high resolution. How, how does this go? Well, uh, I'm just going through that uh, very briefly. Um, so what we do is, actually, we use the electron spin to measure the magnetic moment for some time, then we store the result in the nuclear spins and we retrieve it at some later time. And by this we do our delta phi measurements. In terms of LIGO, right, if you think about that interferometer once again, that is exactly equivalent of making the, the interferometer arms longer, right? LIGO has a four kilometer arm and only then it is able to measure these small phase differences. And we don't make our you know, interferometer arms longer, but we make the time over which we can accumulate the phase longer by storing basically the quantum phase of the electron spin in this long-lived memory. And this T here now gets seconds, and so we can actually hope to measure uh, very narrow lines. And indeed, that's the case, so cutting a long story short, that's once again our old spectrum. This is here spectral intensity over the frequency axis. This is without using the memory trick, and this is with using the memory trick, and if I blow this up now, then the line width is on the order of 20 hertz. So that's almost where we want to go. There is a, maybe a factor of five missing or so to compete with regular NMR technology. And once you have done that, actually, you completely change the field, right? Sensitivity is no issue anymore, right? Sample size, sample quantity, no limitation anymore. Okay, so what is it we want to do? So we actually, what we want to do is uh, we, we uh, actually uh, now combine our diamond chips here. Uh, we put complex structures on top, for example, these cell membranes, and we, then we use each of these defect centers here to read out the local you know, structure in, in, these, uh, in these cell membranes. That's one of the things we try to do. Uh, on, on a length scale of 10 nanometers. So we do MRI, that's basically what we want to do on length scales of 10 nanometers instead of uh, length scales of 10 millimeters, that's what you do right now. It's not only, you know, it's not only bio you can, you can address this to. One of the things we're applying it to is looking into uh, batteries, right? Uh, lithium, for example, is, is, uh, carries a nuclear magnetic moment 
and changes in these lithium electrodes uh, as a function of battery operation time is one of the reasons why lithium batteries degrade. And we want to, you know, we have a, we are building a lithium cell here with a diamond window into which we have integrated the sensor layer and we want to look actually at the structural changes in this lithium electrodes here on a submicron scale. All right, so, so that's uh, almost it. I'll briefly go through this temperature measurement just to give you an idea of that it's not only you know, magnetic fields we, we can measure. So how do you measure temperature? Once again, these are only a few slides and then uh, I'm, I'm done. So how do you measure temperature actually uh, with these sensors? Now, the, the idea is actually pretty trivial, right? Uh, when you put a solid uh, into an environment with a certain temperature, you measure a certain lattice constant. If you change the temperature, lattice constant is changing, right? That's what everybody knows. And what basically we do is we use these spins to measure local lattice constants. And how is this done, right? Remember, the ground state of this defect is a spin one system, which basically means that you have two electron spins. Okay, and if you have two electron spins in the ground state, they make dipolar interaction. All right, that's what you see here. This dipolar interaction depends on one over r cubed when r is a distance. So when the lattice constant changes, the dipolar interaction changes. And by measuring the spin splitting in the ground state, we exactly measure this dipolar interaction of the two spins. So by a precision measurement, actually, of you know, the spin splittings here, we do a precision measurement of the lattice constants. And you can apply force, right? And force also changes that lattice constant. That's only tiny changes, but because we have this long phase memory times, so we can measure this very precisely. This is how, how actually the idea is. And it's actually, uh, there are a couple of uh, groups working on that. Uh, this is, for example, you see that goes from 15 to room temperature. That's a uh, measurement of the spin splitting here. And you see that the line you know, changes as a function of temperature. And this is from David's group, uh, measurement up to 700 degrees, uh, up to 700 K. And you see the line position also changes. Okay, so that, that's a proof of principle that this works. Now, uh, sensitivity, by the way, is millikelvin square root of hertz. Once again, not good, uh, but you can make that, measure that on very small length scales. Um, and uh, well, so, so how, how do you do these measurements on small length scales? Now, now we do that uh, in, in the following way. Instead of using, a, say, a bulky diamond or a diamond chip, we use nano diamonds, right? We make very small diamond particles, which we dope with these NV centers or other defects. Um, the good thing is, if you look at, this is the fluorescence of photon count as a function of time, uh, these nano diamonds have very, very long uh, photostability in, in contrast to quantum dots or, or uh, out of fluorescent dyes. And the reason for that is that if you take such a nano diamond, then actually the wave function of the defect is very much localized over a few lattice constants. It never comes to the surface of the diamond uh, in contrast to quantum dots, for example. Now, the smallest nano diamonds we work with uh, actually mm, are pretty tiny. They, they have a diameter of less than two nanometers, and that means around 500 carbon atoms. And that's an interesting carbon phase in its own right, right, from a material science point of view, but we just use these kind of diamonds for local temperature measurements. Okay, and one thing we do with that is we measure temperature in cells. Right, so we put these nano diamonds uh, into cells. They, they go into cells by themselves. Uh, well, the cells actually take them up. Uh, and, and so this would be, this is the cell here. Uh, and uh, we put in these nano diamonds. Uh, and when we put them into cells, we can see them uh, by, you know, the red light they emit. And if I do an overlay here, then this is actually how it looks like. Um, and then we use these nano diamonds to measure local temperature. These green things here, by the way, are mitochondria. They are these mitochondria, if you know a bit of cell biology, they are actually the powerhouses, the power cells of cells. All the metabolism is going on there, and they deliver nutrition to the rest of the cell. So we were interested in 
if when these mitochondria here, when you make them operate very fast, if they heat up, right? When you do exercises, you heat up, right? And we want to see if they make exercises here, if they heat up, and if, he, if so, uh, to what extent. So we were, uh, well, what you see here is part of a cell. That's a nuclear cell membrane, right? And this is a mitochondrium here, and that's a nanodiamond. We were using a NAD nanodiamond, almost 100 nanometer or so in diameter, just to make it, to visualize it better here in, in this micrograph. And then we, we, you know, we heat up, the, the mitochondria you heat up by actually poisoning them. You, 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 you treat them with chemicals and then they run at maximum speed and then they, well, they heat up. And then if the nanodiamond touches the surface because diamond has a very high heat conductivity, it actually, you, you easily measure the temperature here at this point where it touches. And that's what we did, and it doesn't tell you a lot. This is here at uh, temperature in, in, in degrees Celsius as a function of time, and here we apply a chemical and you see the microchondrium heats up by quite, uh, quite a large uh, uh, temperature, by the way, four degrees almost. And what we were mostly interested in, and cell biologists and, and cell biophysicists, are these kind of oscillations. Because these oscillations here, they, they indicate a thermal regulation me mechanism inside cells, right? And this is the only way you can reliably measure temperature on, say, some 10 nanometer length scale in a way that you don't put leads or so anywhere. And this is something you don't need to do. You deploy your sensor. It's eaten up by the structure you want to investigate. And the only interrogation you have is by the laser, right? That's what makes this uh, um, a unique method. All right, so that's it. Uh, outlook. Um, actually, where does this go? Well, the, the kind of quantum technology or quantum spintronics or so, if, if you like, uh, has implications which go far beyond what I was uh, talking about here, right? I was you know, making lots of examples in terms of biology, but this is simply because it's close to our heart. Uh, that must not be the case, right? Uh, actually, if you, if you make a, this kind of table here, a chart, and if you compare classical sensor technology for these various you know, quantities here, uh, then you see that quantum or quantum projected means that it's a, a calculation, right? A theory, theoretician's dream or maybe an experimental physicist's dream of where actually sensitivity goes. And uh, I was talking about magnetic fields, I was talking about nuclear spins, uh, a bit about forces, but, but these structures are also good for measuring, for example, rotation or also gravitation, right? Once again, very much like LIGO is doing. Uh, and well, once again, this number here uh, is what we dream about. This is uh, what we uh, can measure. And we just measure gravitation actually by measuring the oscillation frequency of a nanomechanical or micromechanical device. And we measure that oscillation frequency by the defects we put in. But that's quite amazing because if you can do that, you can make a kind of gravitational wave camera. So you can look through buildings, you can look in Earth and these kind of things. And we think we are good in there. Uh, there is one example I wanted uh, to uh, share with you and as a kind of you know, more industrial application of this. And this is measuring rotation. Uh, everybody is, we are all operating rotation measurement devices, right, every day. If you turn your mobile phone or your tablet, you measure, you use a device, uh, actually, which measures the gyration of that device. This is how, the, you know, the, the screen turns up and down, right? These are MEMS devices, okay? Uh, they don't need to be very precise. Their precision uh, is, is uh, uh, it, it's good enough if it's, say, 10 degrees or so per say, square root of hertz, right? And that's what's used in car industry or so, and in most industrial applications. The most sensitive measurement devices, if it comes to gyration, actually are built in planes. You know, these are laser gyros, and this is how the aut autopilots actually get a sense of if the plane is, is rotating and moving, right? Of course, planes are using GPS, but you only get a plane licensed, an autopilot licensed, if it can operate with a certain precision without GPS contact, right? There might be no satellite signal, for example, and then your autopilot needs to know where to go. And for that, you need a, 
gyration measurement device, which is long time stable and precise. And this is why planes use this device. So that was the, the kind of industrial uh, chart uh, 10 years ago, or say five years ago. And then came these autonomous cars, right? These autonomous cars, they also need to maneuver uh, with pretty high precision, uh, by the way. And they need to be able to, or you need to show as a producer that you can operate those cars, that you can achieve these kind of precisions here in, in gyration uh, without GPS contact. Right, that's a licensing condition. In Europe, you only get an autonomous car licensed if you can show that it can operate without GPS contact for one hour with a maneuvering precision, with a localization precision of 30 centimeters. That's the size of the bumper. Okay? And this is why you need uh, uh, very precise uh, gyros. Okay? So where do these gyros come from? And they need to be compact, right? Uh, the gyro in a, in a, in a plane uh, looks like this has a diameter of 30 centimeters or so, and you, this is basically a laser gyro where the laser beam is, is circling around. And you can't make it more compact because the way you detect gyration depends on the area the, the, the laser beam or the uh, fiber is wound around. Well, cutting a long story short, there, there are a couple of papers out of how to do this better with spins. Spins are also gyros, right? They have an angular momentum and you use angular momentum conversation, uh, conservation to uh, precision measurements of gyration. And this is now what we try uh, to realize in Stuttgart. Stuttgart is a, you know, a car town, and we try to actually make a precision integrated gyros for car industry. That's, that's one of the things we want to do. And here is what we need to achieve. All right, uh, that's it. Um, so I'm, I'm, once again, I'm a basic physicist by heart. But what I learned when, is when, when we talk to people to apply our technique and also to industry, uh, you can wave your hands and say, well, in principle, I'm, I'm doing that and I'm doing that. If you don't demonstrate it, hardly anybody will, will listen to you. And this is why in the past couple of years, we were turning our uh, you know, lab scale uh, instruments, which, which look like this, into shoebox sized instruments like this, or now this is a this is actually a magnetometer, a diamond-based magnetometer, which has the size of this remote control, right? And its sensitivities are on the order of nanotesla square root of hertz, 10, 10 watts power consumption. And actually, why are we doing these things? And this is my, this is my last remark. And actually, that came about, making these kind of structures here, these kind of magnetometers, came about uh, by a discussion with Bosch. I don't know if you know that company, if it sells uh, stuff here in the US. Well, they are making car electronics, but they also do, I don't know what, drills, saws, and these kind of things for uh, you know, plumbers and so on and so forth. And they were telling us if you can make a magnetometer which has a sensitivity uh, on this order of magnitude and which is, you know, can be operated by an ordinary man, you are in business. And why is this so? Um, probably everybody of you has a uh, drill the hole in, in, in the wall at your home, right? And what you always hope for is not to drill a hole in a water pipe, uh, for example, right? And how do you avoid that? You avoid that by uh, using indicators, sensors, which indicate the presence of a water pipe. And the way this is done typically is by induction, right? The point is modern water pipes, at least in Europe or in, in Germany, are not made out of metal anymore. So these devices don't operate, they, they are not functional. Well, what's, what's the workaround? You turn on the water pipe, you let the water flow, there are ions in the water, and they generate a magnetic field like the ion currents in neural cells generate a magnetic field. That magnetic field for, for a one inch, is it one inch? Yeah, probably, no, it's half an inch of a water pipe under normal pressure, at least in, in Germany, is 100 nanotesla at 20 centimeter distance. Okay, so if you can prove that thing here, if you can make that thing with a good enough sensitivity and that's good enough, then you will see the water flowing in your wall, right? And that was the onset of that uh, kind of miniaturization endeavor we did. Okay, so with that, uh, I thank you for your intention and I'm more than happy to answer questions. Oh, thank you very much.
Professor, uh, how about a few questions? Do we have time? We have time for a few questions, I believe. Please wait for a mic to get to you, if you don't mind. Is a, is there an upper temperature limit, or what is the upper temperature limit of the nano diamond temperature sensors? One of the challenges we have is measuring the temperature in a diamond anvil cell, actually measuring the pressure as well when it's at temperatures of a few thousand Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Well, a diamond burns under the ambient uh, pressure, right? Ambient uh, at, at around 1,500 Kelvin or so. If I'm not mistaken, that would be a, an upper limit. Nano diamonds tend to burn earlier, where actually they turn into graphite. So, with a nano diamond, we would say if you go uh, above uh, 100 Celsius or so, 400 K, that, that's going to be tough. But this would be an oxygen free environment, you know, well, inside where there's, well, you know, some if, uh, if you talk noble about gas. It, yeah, and, and you operate an anvil cell anyway, right? So you can go to, to fantastic temperatures, a couple of thousands of Kelvins, right, because you apply a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about your comparison with the NMR that you made to, and um, in, there, in that technique, now you can do things like heteroatom uh, correlation mapping, so like two-dimensional mapping using, in that case, yes. the chemical uh, yes. different spins of different yes. uh, atoms. Yes. If you were to try and make that analogy to your quantum sensors, could you, say, take two different types of sensors with, therefore, two different types of decay profiles and actually use some form of correlation mapping to get a new extendable capability? Um, what the, the one thing is, um, of course, I mean, the, 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 the NV just replaces your induction coil. So you can apply all NMR tricks you, you, you want to apply on the nuclear spins. Right, if I understood your question right, you ask if you could, so to say, do that on the level of the, say, the sensor spins themselves. Yes. Yeah, you can do gradiometry. This would be exactly what you want to have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this was very impressive. So with your nano diamond also, can you detect the other you know, parameters you mentioned, electric field and uh, mm -hmm. spin with those? And are the surfaces chemically modifiable? Can you yeah. derivatize them? Right now, you just put them in. Yeah, that's right. That's, uh, well, of course, you can. Um, everything I was you know, explaining you know, for bulk diamonds or chips or so also works with a nano diamond, right? Sensitivities typically are lower because spin relaxation times are faster. Typically, you lose an order of magnitude or so in sensitivity. So you can measure local electric fields. That's what we want to measure, use, for example, to measure local electric fields in, uh, on, on cell surfaces and these kind of things. But you can also apply it to other uh, sensing modalities. Yes. And now, uh, the critical question is, can you functionalize these diamonds? Can you control the surface? And the, uh, the answer is so-so, right? Not really super very good. Uh, although it's carbon, carbon has a well-studied chemistry. Obviously, there is a whole wealth of different carbon, whatever bonds on the surface, and to homogenize the surface and then do very good chemistry is something which people try since a couple of time, years, but it's not really very good so far. Uh, <clears throat> great talk, thank you. Uh, you were mentioning uh, mainly the sensitivity to the nuclei, to NMR spectroscopy, right? Like around 100 nuclei you can, can yes. detect. But what about electron spin? Can you go to the single spin yes, in EPR yes. detection? Yes. Or can yes. you say something about that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I was somehow not showing that, that uh, results, but, but uh, this one MRI result, right, where we were labeling the cell membrane with this one paramagnetic compound, that's an example of detecting EPR with this sensor. And recently, last year, we did a study where we were putting a single spin label on a single protein, and we were measuring EPR of that single spin label, and also measuring that it was a DR measurement, right? And we were, with that, we were measuring the, the local you know, flexibility of the protein and the mo motion of that. Electron spins, in a certain sense, are easier because they have a larger magnetic moment. They are a bit more delicate because it always requires chemistry to bring them at places where we want them to be, right? That's Um, you also mentioned uh, silicon carbide and YAG as other systems where you had uh, right. these kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
these uh, detectors, uh, single spin detectors. So, what, 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 how do those compare to NV centers for yeah. for their uh, sensitivity? Yeah, uh, the the best comparison is silicon carbide because it's also a material where electron spin relaxation times are long, and that is sensitivity is good. Silicon carbide for the moment loses on this constant C. Uh, because that constant C basically gives, gives you the photon flux, the amount of photons you get from your defect center. And there, silicon carbide, at least all the defects we know so far, uh, are way, uh, are pretty much worse, right? Um, so that you would typically you lose at least, say, two orders of magnitude on all the uh, uh, order quantities so far for single uh, centers, right? Yak, the, the rare earth in Yak do have the issue that it does not work very well at uh, room temperature. And the reason is that these rare earths, they have lots of spin orbit coupled states which are close by and you have fast spin relaxation. They work fantastically at low temperature, uh, but room temperature is not very good. Uh, on this last slide, on the prototype, uh, let's take prototype Mark II. Yes. How far do you need to be from the uh, target? It, well, it, it very much depends, of course, on the target you have. A water pipe, right? The magnetic field decays as 1 over r. So you're pretty tolerant with respect to distance. Uh, so once again, with the water pipe, right, uh, I think with, with our sensitivity, we can be something like uh, 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters away and still would detect the, the water flow, right? That's, that's a kind of ballpark figure. But of course, if you, for example, want to use that to measure, you know, brain activity fields, this is way too, uh, uh, way too low sensitivity. Typically, the, the alpha, well, um, the low frequency uh, neural magnetic fields of the brain do have an amplitude of, say, 20 to 30 femtotesla square root of hertz, right? So that's a couple of orders of magnitude for that, uh, with, with respect to this prototype thing. Maybe one more question. No, oh, back here. Um, when you talked about temperature measurement, what is actually being measured is the distance, not the temperature. And then, of course, temperature is related to the yes. distance by the coefficient of thermal yes. expansion. Yes. But if I simply take that number, something on the order of millikelvin, that translates to something uh, close to 10 to the minus 9 in terms of the lattice parameter. Yes. Uh, that small uh, increment by itself, do you mm -hmm. see any potential applications for measuring the distance on that order of magnitude rather than yeah, temperature? That's a good remark. When, when the LIGO people were talking about their sensitivities, right, I was exactly coming uh, trying to do that calculation by myself, um, the, the answer to that is, uh, I'm not sure, uh, because if, well, what you actually, you, of course you change the lattice constant, but upon changing the lattice constant, you of course also change the electronic wave function. So in principle, you need to renormalize the whole electronic system, right, to do the calibration you were talking about. So it's, it's not that, that, I mean, I was very much simplifying it. And this one over R actually needs, the dipole interaction needs to be averaged over the electronic wave function. And that's also certainly are going to change in itself as a function of temperature. This is why I would, um, I'm, I'm somehow hesitating to, um, you know, stretching it too much to the limits. In other words, this relationship is not exactly linear on the large Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Range. In addition, there, well, there, we can talk about that offline, but there are other, once again, this renormalization thing needs to be considered. So, uh, uh, as with LIGO, of course, right, where basically you can measure that distance to such a precision, I mean, it's one thousandth of a diameter of a proton or so, uh, this is, um, you, you, of course, don't measure the, the distance to a single nucleus, uh, to a single proton in, or to a single nucleus in that mirror, but to the whole mirror in itself. So it's, uh, uh, and this is basically the same here also, right? 
when I'm, I'm grossly oversimplifying when I say I have the two electron spins and it's just one over R cubed. That's not the case. Of course, the whole solid state environment goes in. And then how precise you can measure temperature, taking all this into account, I can't say. Thank you. How about a final round of applause for Professor Rock?